about we give it up for the dads of 1122? Happy Father's Day. And if you're wondering, like, hey, what I give my dad? How about give him a break, all right? For 24 hours, don't correct him. That'll be the best presents he's ever gotten from you. And, uh, and from the wives, if you're like, what do I get to hit my husband? You know. <laughs> you know. I'll give you a clue. Same thing he wanted for his birthday. You tracking with me? All right. Better than a tie. Amen, boys? Amen. All right. Hey, listen. We are in the uh, 11th week of this series called Give Love a Try. And the whole idea in 1 John, or one of the big ideas, is that love is not just a feeling. Um, love is an action. Love is a decision of the will accompanied by action. Love is something that you do, not just feel. And so that's why we've been calling our church to give love a try, to, to put our love into action. And we, and you, us as a church, we have been loving our community, again, not just with thoughts and words, but with actions and deed and truth. And so here's some of the things that we as a church have done during this series. Um, that we have loved our city by donating 8,728 pounds of food for hungry people right here in Jacksonville. That's a big deal. We've loved our families by 33 children being dedicated to be raised in gospel-centered homes and a gospel-centered church. That's a big deal. We have loved the least of these all over the world by sponsoring 524 more Compassion Kids and sending out 500 letters to explain the gospel to those kids. We've loved Jesus by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people a few weeks ago professing Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior in baptism at the beach. Um, we've also loved our community. This a couple last week, uh, we had a lot of folks here um, go and serve a community that was in need of some service, like painting and yard work and that kind of stuff. And and we donated 4,800 man hours in conjunction with Builders Care. About a hundred of you served all week long. And also in that service, 30 people surrendered their lives to Christ and were baptized. The community that we were serving. Also, the kids at our church said, hey, this isn't just for old people, um, it's for us too. And so 60 of our children participated in a local mission trip. And we have the ongoing ability to love our community with Hope's Closet. And we started receiving donation um, to our thrift store and 15,000 articles of clothing and different all of your stuff uh, you've donated here. Way to go. And I can't wait for the day where you show up to church one day and go, hey, I recognize that church because I'm going to be preaching in one of your old church. Isn't that cool? So... Um, you can keep those donations coming, but let's give God the glory and a hand 1122 for giving love a try. Way to go. <clears throat> so if you've got your Bibles, go to uh, 1 John chapter 4. We're going to pick it up in verse 7. And again, the reason that we love is because God first loved us. We don't love so that God will accept us, but because Christ has made us acceptable by the finished work of Christ on the cross, our response to that is love. That's what we're talking about. So 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 7, it says, Beloved, and I promised you I was going to do this over and over and over, but I need you to see that word beloved, not just as a category, but a command. That God is a good dad, and he wants to love his people, so just be loved. He's a good dad that wants to lavish his love upon his children. And you say, well, how can I be a child of God? Anyone that would receive the love of God, anybody that would be loved, that's what God wants. That makes you the beloved. So listen, beloved, those of you that, that are being loved, let us love one another. Now, at this point, really from here on, John kind of puts it on repeat, okay? 30 times in the book of 1 John, he tells us to love one another. And you, you might ask, you might ask, well, why? Why should we love one another? Because honestly, our world teaches us it's not about love one another. It's about survival of the fittest. It's about, it's just an accident. We just got here by accident. It was just, we just happened to be the strongest or the luckiest in this big cosmic accident. There is no place for love in atheism because there's no reason. There's no, there's no reason why. You see, the Christian is called to a much higher standard than the bumper stickers that you see out there that say uh, coexist and tolerance. Coexist is a very, very low value. I coexist with the bugs that live in my front yard. Do you know that? We all live together. It's fine. But I do not love them. In fact, I'll kill them if I, every time I get a chance. We are not called to just tolerate one another. You tolerate a smell in your car until it's too bad that you have to do something about it, okay? That is not what we are called to do with one another. We are called to love one another. Beloved, let us love one another. Why? For love is from God. That's right. That love is from God. That's why we love. Because God is the source of love. And God gives us the ability to love. And so, love is an inexhaustible resource, and the reason why is because God is an inexhaustible resource. 
So, yeah, I, I remember when we were going from one kid to two kids, right? And, and Gretchen and I would have these conversations like, are we going to be able to love the second one like we love the first one? People that have multiple kids, you all thought that. And the reason is because we didn't understand love. We thought we had a limited amount of love, and if we had enough of them, we had to divide it up. Like, sorry, you get half as much now because this one over here needs half too. That is not the way it works when you go from one kid to two kids to 20 kids, however many you want to have, all right? Be fruitful and multiply. You know what happens, that as your kids multiply, your love multiplies. And so the Bible says, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. That it is our love that demonstrates to the world, one, that we've been born of God. That we're God's kids. You know, like if you've got little kids and they look like you and people look at your kids and be like, yep, they, those come from you. Obviously. That's what the world does. The world sees us loving and says, you must be born from God. Because God is love. And not only that, when we love, not only is it evidence that we've been born of God or we're God's kids, it's also evidence that we know him. That we know him. We don't just believe the right things about him, but, but by the way we love one another, it's evidence that we know God. Verse 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, the Bible does not say that love is God. We live in a world that kind of thinks that love is God, that ooey-gooey feeling that we have, that that's God. And God's in here, and God's out there, and God's everywhere. No, that's pantheism. We believe, the Bible teaches that there is creator and there is creation. The creation that, that we people were created in the image of God. And God is love because God, in and of himself, is a perfect love relationship that has ex existed from eternity past to eternity future. That God is a trinity. That there's one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God, in and of himself, has been satisfied with himself. God has been in a submissive love relationship with himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. If you think about it too long, your head will explode. And if you try to use any kind of analogy to describe it, it's usually heresy. So you just got to take it this way, okay? There's one God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so God is this perfect relationship all by God's self. And out of an overflow of God's love for God's self, it spills out into creation, into the canvas that is the world that we live in. And then people, me and you, that we have been created in the image of that God that is love, which means that people, me and you, with the image of God, image bearers of God, have an ability to give and receive love like no other part of creation. That we are the only part of creation that loves, that, is in, in, that was created to give and receive love like that. And I know what you say, no, 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 my dog loves. I got bad news, okay? I know you love your dog. Your dog doesn't really love you. Your dog loves peanut butter, okay? And you just happen to have the peanut butter. I know it breaks your heart. It really does. And I'm sure you have feelings. That's why love is not a feeling. Love is a decision of the will accompanied by action. Here's the truth. I could take your dog, put him at my house for a while, and maybe not overnight, but over time, when they recognize I am the new producer of the peanut butter, guess who they love? Me. It's just different. My dad told me one time, this is the worst thing I've ever heard, but I love it. For Father's Day, this is how I'll honor him. He said, you want to know who loves you? Take your wife and your dog, put them in the trunk of your car, ride around town for an hour, open the trunk, see who's happy to see you. All right? See, here's the thing. <laughs> I don't know where he comes up with this stuff. It's great. Because <clears throat> your dog is just going to be like, ah, there he is again, right? Your dog really loves your dog. And you're just a means by which your dog can love himself, right? And so, but we were created in the image of God to love one another. Because God is love. God is a triune God. So the Bible says anyone who does not love, this is big, does not know God because God is love. Let me say it this way. If your version of Christianity does not stir in you love for one another, you're doing it wrong. You're fundamentally doing it wrong. You've missed kind of the whole point of the whole point. That if God is love and God's love in you should cause us to love one another, that if your faith in Christ, if your understanding of the gospel, if your reading of the scriptures, if your progressive sanctification does not result in more love for one another, then you're doing it wrong. And what's crazy, here's what's crazy. So last week, you know, last week we talked about um, one of the most problematic claims of Jesus, that he claimed exclusive way to God. He said he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one gets to the Father except through him. That last week, John said, Without Jesus, you don't get God. Now, here's what's crazy. In, in the text, there's no gap. It just goes straight through. 
That was verses 1 through 6, and now 7 and on says that we're supposed to love one another. And if anybody doesn't love, they don't know God. Now, here's what I've found, mostly just in my own experience. The people that seem most closely aligned to the gospel, the people that seem most closely aligned to taking the Bible very seriously, the people that got last week's sermon the best, that there's not a bunch of different pathways up to heaven, but, but Jesus came down on a rescue mission for us. I mean, let's be honest. Most of the time, it's those people that are the least loving Christians I've ever met. Is it not true? The people that are most theologically and doctrinally right are often the least loving people that I know. And the opposite of that is true. I mean, you can think churches or denominations or individuals. It seems that oftentimes, the people that are the most gracious and the most caring and the most socially minded and that are loving and merciful... It also, it seems like those are the people that aren't really too concerned about what it takes to get to heaven. And that's really, really important. And it seems to me that most of us, most of us tend to lean in one or the other direction. Some of you in the room, you just kind of toward, lean towards the, you know, cotton candy and butterflies. And let's just all hug and hold hands and feed everybody and all of that. And don't worry too much about the doctrine stuff. But let's just love, right? And yet... Then there's another group of people, and they're like, no, 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 no. A lot of us are more concerned about being right than helping people get right with God. And by the way, that's, that's the direction that I lean. Because I, I love to fight. I love to argue, especially when I'm right. And I'm right a lot because I just read the book, okay? So here, here's what I've been scratching my head on this week. It seems to me that the people that understand the gospel the best should be the people that love the most. The people that understand the fact that Jesus came on a rescue mission for us, not because we were right, but because we were crooked and depraved and wretched, and, and it, there was nothing that we did to earn our salvation, but he came on a rescue mission for us. The people that get that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and there's no other way in. There's nothing we could do. We couldn't pray hard enough. We couldn't be good enough. We couldn't think sharp enough, but, but nothing we did, but Christ's finished work on the cross saved us, it seems like. It seems like we should be the most loving people. You see, the thing about Jesus is he didn't come leaning one way or the other. The Bible says that Jesus came full of grace and full of truth. And there's no more full than full. So you couldn't get any more truth in Jesus because he was topped up and overflowing with truth. And, and you couldn't get any more grace stuffed into Jesus because he was full of grace. And he was full of grace and he was full of truth. And if Jesus is in us, then we should be full of grace and full of truth, and we should love one another. And if we don't love one another, then it means that we must not know God. And that's a big deal. And that means we should love like Jesus loved. And, and here's the thing. A lot of us love the people that we love. You know what I mean? Like the people you're like, oh, I love that guy. What do you love about him? Man, I, I love the way he thinks because he thinks like me. And I love the way he talks because he talks like me. And I love the way he looks. He looks like me. Guess what? You just love you. It's just an exercise in loving yourself when you just try to love the people that, that are most like you. But John says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, the question will be then how, okay, so how does God love us? How do we know that God loves us? Verse 9. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. So this is how you know that God loves you. This is how he manifests his love among us. That God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. Underline those words there at the end. Live through him. You see, uh, last week I had a guy come to me and say, hey, at the end of the services, how come you say be free? What is that all about? It, it comes from verses like this. Do you know that Jesus came and died on the cross and was resurrected from the grave so that anybody that believes in him, that trusts him as their Lord and Savior, do you know that we have, we have been set free to be able to live through him? That Jesus says that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life abundantly. The book of Galatians says it's for freedom that you have been set free. That when you know Jesus, that you are free. You are free from we are free from the shackle and bondage of sin. You are free from the power of sin. You can be free from addiction, from anxiety, from worry. You can be free from all the hindrances of this world and all the entanglements of this world. But also, you can also, you're free from the religious pressure that you grew up with. And I'm just going to shoot you straight. 
If you grew up Catholic, if you grew up like fundamentalist Southern Baptist, you have a hard time with this. You don't know what freedom feels like. Because every time you watch a movie that your old preacher told you you weren't supposed to watch, you feel this condemnation. The Bible says, therefore, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That we have been freed to be able to live in him. That means that you are free from performance. That you don't have to wake up anymore saying, what can I do to impress God? God is not impressed with you. What he is impressed with was Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross once and for all. And when Jesus says, it is finished, that means that your performance is over. You don't have to try to impress God anymore. Because in Christ, he is already impressed. So that doesn't mean, that means that you can quit trying to be a better version of you. Get this idea of good Christian out of your head. It's, in fact, it's a love relationship, not performance-based relationship with God. We are free from that performance. And also, we are free from pretending. In the cross of Jesus Christ, you don't have to pretend anymore. You are free from pretending. You don't have to fake it anymore. When you show up to church and people ask you, how are you doing? And in reality, you're not doing well. You don't have to lie and just be like, oh, I'm just blessed to be here today. Just so blessed in his word and with his people. Shut up. Now, I'm not saying you got to throw up on every single person. You know, you don't have to run all your disciple group every time. Hey, can we talk about me for a little while longer? No, I'm not saying that. But, but, the, but the pretending is over. Because you know why? We look around. We, we know we're one big dysfunctional family because we're made up of a bunch of dysfunctional people. You know how we know this? The cross has outed every single one of us. Like, we, we're not just mistakers in need of a life coach. But we're sinners in need of a Savior. And when Jesus says, it is finished, it means that you are free. You are free from the performance, and you're free from the pretending. But what do you do? You just love God and love one another. How? Through Him, who's already accomplished it, because it is finished. And so, if we're supposed to love one another, you might ask, well, what is love? If you grew up in the 90s, remember, we used to ask that question all the time, right? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. Baby, don't hurt me. Oh, no. All right? Those are the kind of definitions we get from our world about love. If you're in the 80s, like I did, Def Leppard told us that love bites. I'm thinking, okay, that's weird. If you're older than that, the Beatles said, all you need is love, and then they broke up. So what is love, all right? What's love got to do with it? The Bible says a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. So I would encourage you to not get your definitions of love from this world, because this world will tell you things like, we love tacos, and we love your mom, and we love your wife. Those are very, very different kinds of love. So the Bible in verse 10 defines love in this is love here we go not that we have loved God but that he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins my favorite word in the whole Bible propitiation okay here's at least at least three things that define love according to God number one is that love initiates this is big love goes first love does not react love isn't love doesn't take from but that love goes first. That not one of us woke up this morning looking for God. But God has been on a search and rescue mission for us. It's not that we loved him. But he loved us. That he first loved us. Because God is first. If you go all the way back to the very beginning of the Bible. When God created Adam and Eve. And the very first sin enters humankind. Adam and Eve rebel. They run from God. And they sow fig leaves together. And they do two things. They try to cover their own sin, that's religion, and they try to hide from God, that's rebellion. All of us do one of those two things. And, and then what does God do? God doesn't come after them with vengeance, he comes after them with love. The Bible says that God walks through the Garden of Eden calling out to Adam and Eve because they were hiding. And it's not like he didn't know where they were. He's God. It's like playing hide and go seat with your three-year-old. Remember those days? Their head would be under the couch and their whole body's in the living room. I think I've found you. Uh-uh. <laughs> yeah. That's us. In the fig leaf situation, that was the very first religion. God, I don't need you. I'm going to cover over my own sin. And the Bible says that God loves us, and he's been walking through the garden of our own life, pursuing us. Love goes first. Love initiates. Also, love does something. In this is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us. Love goes first, love initiates, and two, and sent his son. You see, love does. Love is not just a feeling. Love is not something that you fall in and out of. Love acts. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't just pray about it. He didn't just think about it. He didn't just, his heart didn't just flutter when he looked at us. No, that love does stuff. That's why we say here that love is a decision of the will, a 
accompanied by action that love does. You want to know if you love somebody? See if you're loving them. I talk to married couples sometimes. They're like, you know what? The fire's kind of going out. We just don't really love each other. I'm like, okay, great. So then just love each other. What do you mean? I don't feel. Shut up with your feelings, all right? Love them. Submit to them. Serve them. Be patient with them. Be kind with them. Keep no account of wrongs. Hope, trust, love. Do the things that love does, and guess what will happen to your feelings? You'll love. That's what happens. You see, love does. Thirdly, is that love sacrifices. Love sacrifices. Love costs something. And the person that loves is willing to give that something up for the sake of loving that person. That's why it says that Jesus, he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. This is so important, so important. In fact, one of the reasons, probably the biggest reason we, we use the ESV version of the Bible is because of that one, one word right there, propitiation. A lot, of, um, a lot of English translations of the Bible don't think you're smart enough to understand what the word propitiation is. But I, again, I contend if you can order at Starbucks, you're smart enough to know what propitiation means, okay? And so a lot of times, a, a lot of versions will translate that word that gets, gets translated propitiation as an atoning sacrifice. And Christ's death on the cross is an atoning sacrifice, but that's not enough. You see, the word propitiation means a payment that satisfies. This is so big, a payment that satisfies. That we have an almighty, just, righteous, holy God, and he will not, cannot overlook sin. Because if, if he just overlooked sin and sin was not paid for, he would not be holy and he would not be just. So he is just, and he is the justifier. He sends Jesus to be the payment or the propitiation for our sin. The payment that satisfies. So not only are your sins forgiven at the cross for anybody that would surrender to Jesus, but also the wrath of God is satisfied in Christ. Here's why that's important to your daily life. That means God could never be dissatisfied in you. Because honestly, what do you think about when you think about what God thinks about you? Because you know what most of us think about? Most of us think that God is really dissatisfied in us. Most of us think that, you know what, we're trying hard, but God kind of looks down on us every day, especially on the weekends, and is like, really? Again, seriously? How much longer am I going to have to put up with you? And we think that God is really dissatisfied in us, and one day when we die and go to heaven, and he's got to take us in because of what Jesus did on the cross, and then he's going to wash all the grime off of us and put us in little white clothes and give us a harp and be like, okay, now you're fine. That is a total misunderstanding of the gospel. Because Jesus is the propitiation for our sin, because he is the payment that satisfies, God cannot be dissatisfied in you. God is not and cannot be disappointed in you because he's not disappointed in his son, Jesus. So not only did Jesus make the payment, but we got the credit for his righteousness. That God made him who was without sin to be sin for us. That we would be made the righteousness of God. You get that? That when God looks at you, he, he's not dissatisfied because of the propitiation of Jesus because of that sacrificial love you see imagine this all right if you're married imagine this imagine when you were um, you know meeting your spouse and you first started going out on dates with them imagine if you had to be like perfectly honest about all of your hang-ups can you imagine you see dating is an exercise in conditional love it is it is an exercise in conditional love you take somebody out you get that Chili's bill and you're thinking hmm if they're not good enough, we're not doing this again, okay? I don't know, is she worth the 60 bucks or not? That's what you're trying to figure out. Call it what it is, that's what it is. Imagine if you showed up to your first date, and you had a little chalkboard necklace on, you know, a little placard here, and it had some of your hang-ups there. You had to be honest on your first date, right? Snores, terrible morning breath, never puts the seat down, kind of moody, lies when necessary. What if you had to tell the truth about you? What would happen? You would never get a date. People would look at that and go, nah. In Christ, he sees that list. He sees the list of our sins and our imperfections and our habits and our poor decisions. He sees all that and he goes, I will take you. You, I want you in your imperfection. And by the atoning sacrifice on the cross, he takes the eraser and he wipes off your slate but he does not give you a blank slate. You don't want a blank slate. That's no good. He then takes it and he rewrites it with his own attributes. Holy, blameless, righteous, heir of the kingdom of God, son or daughter of the most high king. That's you. Righteous. 
That's what propitiation means. So when you think about what God thinks about you, you need to know that when God, he doesn't wake up, but when he looks at you, when you wake up in the morning, he, is, he delights in his children. He is satisfied in his people. He is very, very pleased with you, not because you came to church today, because the church came after you. John Stott says it this way. I put it as your final thought in your notes. It says this, for the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God, while the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. Man asserts himself against God and puts himself where only God deserves to be. God sacrifices himself for man and puts himself where only man deserves to be. That's propitiation. Verse 11. So if that's true, verse 11, beloved, listen, that's the kind of love by which God wants to love you. So be loved. So all of us who are loved, beloved, if, this is a big if, you've got to pay attention when the Bible says this. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. One of the guys in my disciple group said, you know, one of the ways we could read this is this. If you say you've experienced God's love, then you can't help but love one another. Because the love of God, if God is love, and the love of God gets in you, then you just can't help but love one another if you've actually experienced the love of God. Verse 12, no one has ever seen God. If we love one another, pause, how? So nobody's ever seen God. So that's what John's saying. But here's a picture. If we love one another, and you've got to ask yourself, how do we love one another? Does that mean like write love notes or have a feeling? No, we love the way God loved us. That's it. So it at least means these three things. One, that you go first. That you forgive first. You extend mercy first. You extend grace first. That you pursue. That you reach out. That love initiates. And right in that moment, you were like, no, 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 no. I can't do that because that's not fair. You don't know what she did to me. That's when you go, ah. But you know what God did when it wasn't fair for you? That he loved you even while we were yet still sinners. Christ died for us. That we forgive like he forgave us. That we extend mercy and grace like he extended to us. That we go first. That we do not react, but that we initiate. Also, that love does something. Again, the way you love somebody is by loving them, by serving them, by sacrificing for them, by making their deal bigger than your deal. You actually do something about it. And lastly, that love sacrifices. That love costs you something. And it's not love until it does. It's just really convenient for you. That's how we love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if you want a picture of God, here's what it looks like. If we love one another, that God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. So what John is saying is this world has not seen a picture of God. But if this world wants to see a picture of God, the closest thing we have right now is the way we love one another. The way we love one another. Not by standing up for what's right, and not by making a point and making a case, but by loving one another. The entire world has its eyes on the gospel this weekend. On Thursday morning, the whole world tuned in to see a picture of the gospel in Charleston, South Carolina. And I don't know if you have seen it, but when they, when they have that murder in court, and, and family members of the slain victims get to speak to him, and you know what they say? They say crazy stuff. They say stuff that does not make sense at all unless they've experienced the love of God. Because they look through a camera at the face of a man that has killed their loved ones. Killed them. And through the tears and through the pain, you know what they said? We, they, the church said, we love you. A murder. And I'm telling you, the whole world, the whole, whether they believe it or not, the whole world is seeing a picture of God. Because you know what they're seeing? They are seeing some people who a man hated, and their response was to love. That's the gospel. Because every single one of us were enemies of God. We hated him. We rejected Jesus. And what does he do? He dies for us, and he loves us, and forgives us, and adopts us into his family. That is a picture of what God looks like. No one has ever seen God. We love one another. God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Here's the point. God is love. If God lives in us, then we should love one another. That we don't have to be, we don't have to pick either grace or truth, but we can be full of grace and truth because if you're a Christian, because you're full of Jesus. Now, oftentimes in the Bible, what Jesus would do when he was teaching 
um, and he was teaching an idea that was maybe tough for people to understand, like this one. He would use pictures, word pictures. He called them parables. And he would, people would come to him and they would ask him questions. Hey, what's the kingdom of God like? And he would just go into this story, right? He'd be like, oh, the kingdom of God is like a man who goes out with his seed. And they're like, huh, well, wait, time out. What are you talking about? But, but Jesus was famous for doing this over and over and over. People would come and say, hey, hey, what does it mean that God does this or doesn't do that? And he'd be like, well, there's a dad and there's two sons. And they're like, oh, can you just tell us? And he's like, no, I'm not going to tell you. I'm going to tell you these stories. That's what he did. And so what we're going to do in our service now is we're going to show you a parable, a parable to illustrate what sacrificial love looks like. Now, let me give you a few warnings. Here's the first one, is that in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in the Gospels, when Jesus would share a parable in the beginning, nobody knew what he was talking about. The whole audience was lost. They're like, hey, didn't you ask about heaven? Uh Uh-huh. So what does this have to do with feeding pigs? I don't know, all right? (laughs) Another thing is um, is that Jesus never explained them. Jesus never explained the parables. There was one parable that he explained to his staff, to the disciples. That one time he tells this parable about a farmer sows some seed and only about a quarter of it makes it and the rest of it doesn't make it for various reasons. And then, like at the campfire that night, Peter's like, hey, boss, uh, what are you talking about? And in that one parable, he explained the details to his disciples in much frustration. So after we show you this parable, I'm not going to explain it. That I want for the rest of you... For the rest of the week, I want you to be like, huh? So am I that guy or that guy? Or right? I want it rattling around. And at lunch, I want you arguing with each other over, no, 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 that's not what it meant. This is what it meant, you know, because it's going to teach and reteach and teach and reteach. And we're going to trust the Holy Spirit to impress upon you whatever he wants to impress. And then the third thing about parables that got Jesus in trouble sometimes is that uh, don't, don't, don't miss the entire point of a parable because of some little detail. You know, like last week, I shared with you that in Luke 11, Jesus shared a parable about prayer, where he said God was like a dad that was asleep with his kids and didn't want to wake up. And so sometimes you can come in and miss the whole point. The whole point of that parable was pray and pray and pray and don't quit praying. It's about the persistence of prayer. But if you miss, if you get hung up in the details, you'll be like, huh, God gets, he goes to sleep? No, 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 no. So we're going to share this parable with you, this picture. Because again, John says, nobody's seen God. You want to see God? Then love one another. That's the best picture we have. So we're going to share a parable with you. And if you're confused at the beginning, awesome. Welcome to Parable Land. And if you're waiting for an explanation, ask your mom. I don't know what to tell you, all right? And, and just, just lean in, lean in to what God might want to impress upon you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So sit up straight and take a look at this parable. You look good. Yeah, thanks. I quit smoking. There's been a rumor going around it's not good for you. You're looking good, too. I mean, you look good. I didn't mean that. 
I know what you meant. I brought this for you. You know what? Now that I think about it, it's kind of stupid. No, it's... It's great. <clears throat> Thank you for meeting me today. Last time I saw you, things weren't exactly... I just wanted to sit down with you ever since. Yeah. I'm sorry I didn't try to write you back. I just didn't know what I would say if I did. I have a question I've been meaning to ask. Can you tell me about her? No. Uh, no, I'm so I, I, I'm sorry, I just, I, I can't, I, I don't wanna, I can't. I'm sorry, you're right, that was uh, wrong of me to just ask that kind of question. Janet. Was her name. And she was the most joyful, compassionate, beautiful person on this earth. And she was a little girl. She used to stand at the top of the stairs twirling in her little dress, singing. She had a crown and her magic wand, and she would go around granting everyone's wishes. I used to say to her, you are a bright light in this world. I've been so lost since that light went out. I'm really sorry. This was a terrible idea to make you go through all of this again. I no. apologize. No, wait. wait I apologize. I, I didn't mean to make you. No, please. I'm not thinking that. Please. I've been learning Latin. I always wanted to sign up for courses. I'm terrible at it. I'm the old guy in the back making Latin jokes. How did Rome get split into two. With a pair of Caesars. <laughs> that is a terrible joke. <laughs> Pretty stupid. <laughs> I have a son. We 
haven't spoken for years. I'm not exactly the best of fathers. But now that he's a father, I think he needs me. My grandchildren will need me to be there. Now that I'm here, I should be. I called him last week. I worked up the courage to talk to him, to say, I'm sorry. I wanted you to know that. You don't have to justify. I do. I really do. It matters to me. I can't make sense of it all. I'm old and pathetic. She's... She was bright and full of life. The only way to make sense of it, the only way to sleep at night, is to try and make it all worth it. When I got that call, and they told me what had happened to her, I couldn't imagine living another day without her. But then they told me about you. It doesn't make sense. It, and I don't think it ever will. But what matters is she gets to keep on doing what she always loved to do. She gets to keep bringing life and love into this world. I just want to make her proud of me. She is, John. She is. Every day that you wake up and you go about your life, that's a day that she's proud of. You love on your son. And you be there with your family. And you live life to the fullest. Because that's what she'd want you to do. That's what she'd tell you. I'm sorry. I, I'm afraid I have to go. Thank you for calling me. It, uh, it had been pulling on me. This was very nice. We, we should do it again sometime. I'd like that. Would you like to hear? Would you like to hear her?
Virginia. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. Please stand and pray with me. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, God, we thank you that for all of those of us that believe, that have surrendered our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, God, you are love, and you live in us, and so your love lives in us, and we should love one another. God, I thank you that that your love initiated that relationship with us. God, that you are first and you went first. God, I thank you and I praise you that love is not just a feeling, but love does, and that love sacrifices. And God, we thank you for the ultimate sacrifice in your son, Jesus, to demonstrate your love for us. And God, I pray that that love in us would spill out to our friends and our neighbors and our city and all over this world. That God, that this church, the church of 1122, would not just be known for its size or growth and those things. That God, primarily, we would be known by our love. That it would be a picture of you for a world that needs love. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Every week we respond to the gospel. We respond by singing. Today we're going to sing. We're going to sing the Lord's Prayer. It starts out, Our Father. Because Jesus is the propitiation for our sin, we're invited to know Jesus as Father. We want to invite you to respond by coming to the altar and praying. Cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And we respond by bringing our first and our best, our tithes and our offerings. Because he went first and he sent his best, Jesus, to die for us so we could respond. Let's respond. 